Hey, good morning, folks. Hey, I woke you up, didn't I? Welcome to Expo. Got our first uh, talk today. Uh, my name is John Grabber. I'm a uh, research agronomist with the um, Agricultural Research Service. Uh, that's part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We're a little department in the uh, Department of Agriculture. And um, I want to welcome you to this presentation. And uh, this presentation isn't about cows. Uh, it's going to be about crops. So we've got to feed those cows uh, to produce that milk. So I just want to welcome you to this morning's session and um, just also welcome you to the World Forage Analysis Super Bowl uh, behind you. encourage you to check that out today. And uh, without uh, further delay, why don't we go ahead and get started with today's topic, which is alfalfa interseeding and corn silage. Now, many of you might be wondering, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to plant alfalfa and corn silage? Well. Um, as I hope it'll become clear as we go through the talk, uh, the reason we're trying to do it, develop the system, is to take care of several issues or shortcomings that we have with uh, corn, and corn silage alfalfa rotations. Now, of course, corn silage and alfalfa are often grown together uh, in rotations uh, to provide forage for livestock, certainly for dairy cattle. Uh, but one of the big problems of the rotation and a reason why a lot of farmers are going away from alfalfa is um, alfalfa has relatively low forage yields compared to corn silage, right? And there's some other reasons too, but yield is a big factor. So if you take a look at my slide here, I'm just giving an illustration that, um, you know, grown corn silage, maybe you can get nine tons of dry matter uh, per acre off of a field. Um, Alfalfa, once it's well established, might give you something like five tons of dry matter. Uh, but the, uh, the problem in terms of alfalfa yield is really that spring seeded alfalfa. A lot of folks will plant alfalfa in the spring after they're done growing corn for a couple of years. And as you know, that spring seeded alfalfa needs a good part of the season just to get started uh, before you can get a harvest. So, you know, if we're in late May or early June, an established stand of alfalfa, you know, is ready to cut, give you a lot of production. And that spring seeding, though, just getting started. So that's a problem. Is there something we can do about those low spring uh, seeded yields of alfalfa? Well, another problem with the um, a rotation, corn silage alfalfa rotation is, of course, corn silage produces a lot of feed. And when you harvest that feed all off, you're left with bare ground. And, you know, if you're spreading manure in that ground, you've got exposed soil, you've got manure, and that's a great recipe for runoff of soil and nutrients. And certainly a year like this, even last night, right? If you were driving here this morning, you just see the streams full of brown water, right? That soil is just washing away. And a good part of that can be coming from our corn silage fields. And not only soil, but of course we got nutrients that are getting into waterways, not nitrogen, phosphorus. And so this is a real concern, of course, uh, getting our waterways polluted. And, you know, you're losing your soil, which is really you're losing your future crop production going down the, down the stream. So um, what the goal of our work is to be able to plant alfalfa into corn. Let's say you grow corn for several years and then you want to rotate to alfalfa. Well, that last year of corn, we want to try and be able to plant or interseed alfalfa into the corn. And the aim will be to use the alfalfa as a cover crop growing in the corn, as you can see here. And then later on, be able to use the alfalfa as a forage uh, crop go right into full production. So what we're aiming to do is we've planted corn and we've planted, I don't know if you can see it in here, the alfalfa is starting to come up as well. So they're being planted at about the same time and uh, they'll grow together. Got a nice stand of alfalfa as a cover crop here. And after the corn comes off, what we want to see is a good stand of alfalfa going into the fa fall. And then the next year be able to go right into full alfalfa production. So 
trying to use alfalfa as a cover crop to help the corn out in terms of its soil loss and, and nutrient loss, among other things. And then have alfalfa established for further soil protection and have it ready to go into full forage production. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, the problem with the system, and people have tried to get it to work for a long time, if you go back in the literature 50 years ago, people were planting alfalfa into corn to do these sorts of things, and it just never really caught on. Because if you plant corn at a high density, you know, like you would for growing corn silage, you're trying to get high yields, there's a lot of shading that's going to be going on, and alfalfa doesn't like growing under the corn. So what you end up with typically in the fall is you take off the corn silage and, oh dear, most of the alfalfa has died. So it just doesn't work. So we've been working for a number of years to try to get the system to work. And so over the course of our studies, we found that there's uh, oh, three, maybe more steps that you need to do to try and get alfalfa established in corn. One of the key things that needs to be done is um, you need to interseed alfalfa soon after the corn is planted. And you also have to harvest the corn in September a little on the early side. And uh, this slide kind of helps to illustrate uh, why that's important. So what we're looking at are different dates for harvesting uh, corn silage in the fall. and the number of plants, alfalfa plants, that we end up in the fall that have survived. We're also looking at the timing that uh, when the alfalfa is interseeded into corn, either planting them together, right at corn planting, so you're planting alfalfa and corn at the same time, or you're waiting a little bit when the corn reaches the V2 stage. So that's pretty small for corn, but you know, you're wait waiting about, oh, two weeks, 10 days to two weeks before you plant the alfalfa. Okay, so let's take a look first at the seeding time for alfalfa. If you plant it, corn planting, we've got a good number of plants in the fall. If you delay the alfalfa in your seeding a little bit, you're starting to lose alfalfa plants. And um, then the other factor, of course, is the corn silage harvest, that, as I mentioned before. If you harvest the corn relatively early, it really helps to ensure that you get high stands of alfalfa or good stands of alfalfa. If you delay later in the month of September, and this is in southern Wisconsin we're talking, uh, you can see that we've lost quite a few plants. So, so why is this? Well, if you plant the two crops at about the same time, it gives the alfalfa a chance to start to get established with the corn before the corn really starts to shade it. So you're giving the alfalfa a chance to get going before it gets heavily shaded. And then what happens in terms of the corn silage harvest is if you harvest the corn a little on the early side, which means you'll have to use a little bit shorter season hybrid, you're giving the alfalfa enough time in the fall to be able to grow in the full sunshine, recover from the severe shading it's been under, and be able to go into the fall and winter uh, with plenty of reserves in the roots uh, to help it survive. So timing of alfalfa seeding and timing of corn harvest are a couple of important factors to help alfalfa survive. Another thing we found that helps is the youth use of um, what I'll call plant protection products. And these would include a product uh, called Prohexadione, uh, fungicides and, if need be, insecticides. Okay, what's prohexadione? Well, there's a good chance that you've uh, eaten um, oh, fruits and maybe some other uh, foods that have been treated with prohexadione. Prohexadione is a growth retardant. It reduces top growth of plants and it encourages root growth of plants. One place or one type of production system Prexidion is a lot on is um, uh, for apple production. You know, if you've grown apples, maybe you've got some in your yard, you've got those suckers that come off every spring, 
Um, you got to trim those off. Well, if you spray an apple tree with praxidione, it keeps those suckers from really growing. And so, uh, and it's used in a number of other crops where you want to restrict top growth, nursery crops too. Well, if you put praxidione on alfalfa, it helps to limit its top growth, encourages it to put down root growth, and that helps the plant to survive. And I'll show some slides that'll help illustrate that. Fungicide and insecticides are helpful to help the alfalfa retain leaves uh, under the corn. So how do these products uh, work? What are, what's the results that you get with them? Okay, across the top, we're looking at a control situation where you're not using any of these products. So kind of mid-season, you've got alfalfa that's in pretty good shape, uh, starting to show some leaf hopper foliar damage though. You get into August, the uh, canopy of the alfalfa senesces back, and um, you get some regrowth from plants, but by the time October rolls around, many of the plants have died. If you use this prohexadione, which is a growth retardant on the alfalfa, you can't quite see it very clearly, but there are a lot more shoots coming up from the alfalfa uh, toward the end of August. And going into the fall, you've got a lot more plants because you've encouraged the alfalfa to not do a lot of top growth under corn, get those roots down. And then if you include uh, with the prohexadione, fungicide, insecticides, you know, we're retaining a lot more leaves. Um, from disease uh, insects aren't causing quite so much problem. And, um, and even better stands as a result. So what does this uh, mean in terms of um, plant density? How many alfalfa plants survive under corn uh, going into the fall and winter? So this slide is showing a relationship between your corn population. And again, these studies are all being done in southern Wisconsin. So a relationship between corn populations, thousands of plants, and how many uh, alfalfa plants you have surviving going into the fall. So um, in the control situation with no plant protection products, you can see at low corn plant density, you can get a decent number of plants, but once you start getting up into populations that you like for corn silage, uh, the alfalfa plants are really getting hammered. Most of them are dying. If you use prohexadione, you can see we've shifted up the whole curve and uh, we've got a lot more plants surviving and using a uh, prexidione with fungicide, insecticide, even better plant survival. And so what does that mean the following year? So we've, we've established um, alfalfa in this first year, got a varying number of plants. Uh, what does that mean in terms of yield the next year? Well, you can see I've got the, uh, the control, prexidione, and then the combination of all the, the plant protection products indicated in different colors here, and you can see that controls, um, and this is the yield that we got for a spring seeded alfalfa, seeded that spring. Uh, that's sort of a reference mark. So the control situation, uh, we, you know, we can get better yields than the um, uh, spring seeded alfalfa, but really where we can max out our yields is where we've used these other products uh, to help uh, get good stands of alfalfa. So we've got good stands of alfalfa, relatively high yields of, of alfalfa forage. So that's one year that was a fairly favorable growing season. So I want you to notice here the, the best uh, treatment, uh, you know, we're up around uh, 32 plants per square foot for alfalfa. What about the following year um, in 2018? 2018 was a rough year for alfalfa to grow under corn silage and you can see instead of, uh, you know, up over 30 plants, everything is shifting way down. So particular year, uh, sorry, I keep cutting out here. Uh, this particular year, you really needed to use all these products, you know, to get a decent number of plants um, surviving under corn and, and ready for forage production. And we did harvest these uh, plots or th this study for forage yields in this year, but don't have the data yet to so uh, show you. So maybe another time. But I think you get the point that these uh, plant protection products can really help alfalfa survival and and help with alfalfa yields uh, the following year. Okay, so I've been mentioning this prohexadione product. Um, gee, can you even use it on alfalfa? Well, we've been working with a number of folks to uh, get it registered and uh, going through the whole process, and we're hoping for the next growing season that it will be labeled. 
for use on alfalfa interseeded in the corn. Uh, the uh, fungicide insecticides, there are a number of ones that can be used on alfalfa and corn, and so no additional labeling is needed for that. But uh, for praxodion, hopefully we're getting close on that one. Okay, so I've mentioned a couple of steps to ensure alfalfa survival. The third one that I'll mention is uh, as best you can, you need to use alfalfa varieties that are well adapted for the system. Uh, we decided to plant out a number of varieties in a couple of locations under corn just to see, gee, does it matter what variety you plant under uh, corn? And it turned out that it did, and it was consistent in several locations. So you can see maybe some of these are some of your favorites that you've planted uh, in recent years. Maybe th some of them are quite familiar from way back, like Vernal. We decided to try some old ones like Vernal and Saranac, as well as uh, some of the more recent varieties. And what we found pretty consistently is um, there's some group of um, alfalfa varieties that do consistently well. Um, under corn, being able to survive under corn, and there's others that pretty consistently do poorly. And uh, this is with uh, just that prohexadione growth retardant applied. So the results may be a bit different if we included fungicide and insecticide, but this helps illustrate that the variety makes a difference. And uh, we've, we're trying to study this further, but we think it's related to the amount of root growth that the uh, alfalfa seedlings put down. It may be that some of these alfalfa varieties here put more root down uh, than these varieties um, um, during that establishment under corn. So trying to understand that a bit better. So variety can make a difference. Okay, so what kind of yields can you get um, over a number of years uh, when we've measured it? Um, if we can get successful establishment of alfalfa under corn, um, what we're looking in the red here are the yields that you can get with a spring seeded alfalfa. So normal seeding after corn uh, the following spring. If we've established alfalfa the previous year under corn, you can see in most cases we're in some cases more than doubling the alfalfa yield. Other times it's not quite as much. But all in all, you know, we're pretty close to doubling the alfalfa yield um, if we can get a good establishment of alfalfa. So that was addressing one of the issues that I mentioned in the corn silage um, alfalfa rotation is that low yield of alfalfa the first year. Well, if we can get interseeding to work, we can get real high yields that first year of alfalfa production compared to the normal system where we spring seeded. So we're get making progress on that front. Okay, of course, uh, we're not only trying to establish and grow alfalfa, but the other part of it, too, is uh, corn silage. We're growing corn silage. And so you're wondering, um, okay, so you plant alfalfa and corn. What is that going to do the corn yields? And so um, let me show that slide next. Um, so this is showing a number of years that uh, we've, we've been measuring corn yields, different locations. Uh, in this work, we've... Um, put down 200 pounds of nitrogen uh, for the corn, which is at the kind of the higher end of recommended rates for corn silage, what, what farmers normally or often would be using for corn silage to help maximize yields. So you can see in the red here are the uh, where we've grown corn by itself, the normal way. In the green are the yields of corn silage uh, where we've interseeded uh, alfalfa into it. So you can see there's some years where we have little or no yield drag associated with the alfalfa interseeding. Other, some years there's a substantial yield drag. And um, so we want to try and find out how we can minimize that yield drag in corn. So there's probably a lot of factors that will influence the yields of corn silage uh, that's grown with interseeded alfalfa. And there's a few examples I'd like to share with you, some things we've been learning along the way. Um, what you find that uh, is when you harvest corn silage, um, what we're looking at here is the, uh, the dry matter content of the uh, corn silage at harvest, and also the yield. 
So in this particular year, uh, what we're finding is there is some yield drag associated with uh, interseeding alfalfa into corn. And what we also observe is that uh, the dry matter content of the uh, corn that had been interseeded with alfalfa is a bit lower. So there's a little bit of a delay in the maturity of the corn when we've uh, interseeded alfalfa into it, maybe about a four-day delay in maturity. And the less mature the corn is, the lower the yield will be. So that may account for some of the yield loss that we're seeing in some cases with interseeded alfalfa. It slows down the development of the corn a little bit. And so the corn hasn't had maybe enough time if we've harvested both these at the same time. The interseeded corn hasn't had enough time to quite mature as far along. So uh, what we may need to do is allow the interseeded... Got a real quick question? Go ahead. Yeah, we're cutting uh, the corn at about uh, six to eight inches. Yeah, yeah, and harvesting the same day, all the corn. Thanks. So if we do some adjustments so that both of the, uh, the corn grown alone and corn grown with interseeded alfalfa, if we adjust the yields, there's some statistical magic you can do to try and uh, make some adjustments. If you adjust them to the same dry matter content, uh, it'll adjust the yields a, a little bit, and, and you see that the yield uh, gap is a little bit smaller. So this is something we need to study some more, is, um, gee, if we let the corn mature a couple more days with interseeded alfalfa, can we uh, help reduce the yield drag? But that might be one factor that's involved. Uh, another factor that's involved is the, the time, timing of when you plant corn. Um, if you plant corn fairly early in the season, which is what you normally want to try and do, um, and also plant alfalfa into it, uh, what you find is, um, you know, there's a, there can be a substantial yield drag with the interseeded alfalfa. So what's going on here? Well, early in the spring, it's cool. The corn has a hard time getting going. What about alfalfa if you plant it in the spring? you know, early May. Is it going to kind of get slow, get off to a slow start? No, those are great conditions for alfalfa. So the alfalfa tends to be quite competitive with corn uh, when corn is planted quite early. And so that competition may cause a reduction in the corn yield. If you, if you happen to be planting corn later, you know, it's warmed up. Corn will pop out of the ground faster, it'll grow faster, and it's more competitive with the alfalfa at that point. And you don't see as much yield drag occurring there. So when you plant your corn, uh, probably affects uh, the degree to which the alfalfa interseeding will reduce corn yields. Okay, another factor is uh, how much nitrogen you're putting on the crop. So uh, what we're looking at is one example here at Arlington, we, l we apply different rates of uh, nitrogen fertilizer to the corn and uh, in uh, this particular year, uh, corn grown by itself um, didn't, didn't really need that much nitrogen to achieve maximal yields. But you notice where we did the alfalfa interseeding, low rates of nitrogen, we are really seeing a substantial uh, yield drag uh, due to the interseeding. Okay, so why is this? Alfalfa is a legume. And legumes are supposed to provide nitrogen for corn, right? Well, well uh, they can if you kill the legume. You know, if you got a legume stand, alfalfa stand, you kill it, it'll then provide nitrogen for corn. But if it's growing with corn, alfalfa is very happy to take nitrogen fertilizer, nitrogen in the soil, and use that for its growth and take it away from the corn. So you need to be putting enough nitrogen uh, on the crops. To, uh, to maximize the yield of the interseeded alfalfa corn system. Okay, so talked a lot about the production aspects um, in terms of uh, alfalfa establishment, dry matter yields of alfalfa, corn yields, factors that influence uh, those. Um, well, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, one of the issues we're trying to take care of in corn silage is... Um, Soil loss, nutrient loss, so can interseeded alfalfa serve as a good cover crop? 
So th uh, this is showing some data from uh, what we did were rain simulation studies. So we sort of set up this booth here with a sprinkler in the top, and we generate artificial rain, and then we collect the, uh, the water and sediment nutrients that come off during that artificial rain. And we did that on a conventional system where we just harvested or just grew corn silage by itself, harvested bare ground in the fall and the spring. And we also did the rain simulations uh, where we um, had alfalfa interseeded in the corn. And so what this table is showing, uh, different times of the year, early June when the corn is just starting to get going, that's what this slide is showing. October after the corn silage is harvested, and then uh, the following April before uh, alfalfa production would begin. What we're looking at is how much has the interseeded alfalfa reduced the loss of soil, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So even early on, when the corn is really small, we can see a substantial reduction in the loss of soil, nitrogen, and phosphorus from the interseeded alfalfa being there. And then later on, after the alfalfa has been really established uh, in the fall, you can see we're, we're really uh, reducing soil and nutrient runoff. So alfalfa really can serve as a good cover crop to help retain soil and nutrients. And also, another issue, of course, is we put a lot of nitrogen down to grow corn. There's always nitrogen left in the soil after you harvest the corn crop. What happens to that nitrogen? Well. Over time, it's either taken up by another crop or it leaches out uh, down into our groundwater, which isn't a good thing, right? So what these graphs are showing is in the red is the normal system where we're just growing corn by itself. And we're looking at different depths in the soil to see how much soil nitrate is left. So when corn is grown by itself in the fall, you go in, soil sample from zero to one foot deep, um, there's a fair bit of nitri nitrate left in the soil, uh, quite shallow. But there's also quite a bit of nitrate going further down into the soil as well. So we got a lot of nitrate left over after the corn is harvested. Where we have corn and interseeded alfalfa growing together, we've got a lot less nitrate up near the surface. And now this is, um, you know, the fall after the corn has been harvested. So less nitrate near the surface and a lot less even further down. And if you wait and s for the sample of soil following spring, you can see that corn, where corn had been by itself, we've still got a lot of nitrate in the soil profile. And actually, it's moving down. It was near the surface the fall. The next spring, it's starting to move down through the soil profile. But where we've um, had interseeded alfalfa as a cover crop, it's doing a good job reducing nitrate levels in the soil. So the interseeded alfalfa serves as a good cover crop, and it helps to mop up that extra nitrate uh, that's in the soil after the corn is harvested. OK, so what about profitability? Well, we've, um, we've tried to come up with some estimates of um, whether or not the uh, interseeding so, uh, system can be uh, profitable or not. And so what we've done here is, you know, look at all the costs involved in growing corn, growing corn with interseeded alfalfa, and um, look at the, uh, the uh, revenue that could be generated from, from the crops uh, based on the production of both the alfalfa and the corn. And so what this table is showing is sort of a relationship with, okay, what we have different rates of success of establishing alfalfa in this system. So in a perfect world, 100% of the time, the alfalfa would get established and we could use it for a cover crop um, and uh, for forage production. But of course, uh, the success rate uh, is going to vary and tend to be much lower than that, uh, depending on how you manage the system. And of course, we also have uh, corn silage yield drag uh, to contend with. You know, in some years, we're going to have reductions in corn silage yield. And uh, that's going to reduce the profitability of the system. So based on a number of years of work, I'm guessing that uh, probably an 
tax rate of alfalfa establishment would be reasonable? Okay. Well, I guess we'll forge on here. Okay, on average, maybe we'll have a 5% reduction in corn yields, um, you know, on average over a number of years. So what's our net return? We're, we're estimating about $144 uh, with the corn alfalfa interseeded system. Uh, we estimated that uh, conventional rotation, growing corn, and then spring seeding alfalfa, the net returns would be $130 per acre. So the green indicates scenarios where you can be making a bit more money, where you'd use the interseeding system. The grays indicate scenarios where you're starting to lose money by the interseeding system. So you can see that you know, we want to be aiming for fairly high establishment success and not too much yield drag on corn. So unlike a lot of, or probably most other, or all other cover crop systems, there is potential to make a little bit more money with the alfalfa interseeding system if we can get it to work reliably well year after year. Okay, so, but, you know, all is not rosy. Uh, things don't always work out the way you want, and there are some shortcomings to the system. Okay, what year do you think this photo was taken? 2012, I saw some lips moving back there, right? Some of you had, many, maybe many of you had corn that looked like that, right? Well, in this kind of a situation, a real dry spring, there's just no moisture in the soil profile. You either get alfalfa taking hold and competing with corn for water, or the alfalfa just doesn't get going at all because there's just not enough moisture in the top. So in case a really dry spring, no moisture in the profile, um, you just don't interseed. You probably don't want to be interseeding any kind of cover crop into corn, right? Because it won't take, or if it does, um, it'll compete with the corn too much. Another problem, and it's like this fall and recent falls, is, boy, when it's time to go out and harvest the corn silage, if that ground is soggy, it's going to tend to tear up that alfalfa stand. So this is a real concern. And so you can't control that. You can decide whether or not you want to interseed alfalfa in the spring, but if it's interseeded and you get a wet fall, well, what, what can you do about that? Well, as best you can, you try not to harvest the corn silage on ground that's real soggy. But if it is soggy, and this is a photo from a producer field uh, up near Brilliant, northeastern Wisconsin, um, you can see where they track through their harvester and other wagons and so forth. The alfalfa that had been interseeded has gotten chewed up a bit. And uh, later in the fall, you do have recovery of a lot of that alfalfa. But sort of the take home story here is if you've got wet fields and you've got alfalfa interseeded in there, you don't want to be just driving all over the fields. You want to be careful to be minimizing how much tracking you're doing through those fields. And that's probably a good idea anyway to help reduce soil compaction in general in the field or damage to the field, whether you've got interseeded alfalfa in there or not. Okay, so we've been working on a number of things. There's quite a number of things that we're still working on to uh, try and optimize the system to get it to work well. I'll let you kind of work through the list. So there's a lot of things. We're, we're changing one thing. We're planting alfalfa into corn, but there's a lot of aspects of the management system that really need to be looked at and refined to get it to work as, as well as possible. And uh, to help out with the work, we've been fortunate to get a couple of grants, a uh, USDA grant. And this particular grant is with folks in a number of states, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and Idaho, looking at factors of that are involved in uh, ensuring successful establishment of alfalfa interseeded in corn. A couple of things that we found uh, from the work so far is if you're going to interseed alfalfa and corn, you have to have a good seed bed suitable for alfalfa. Corn can tolerate a rougher seed bed, more trash, all that kind of stuff, but if 
you're going to plant alfalfa in there, you got to have a decent seed bed preparation. So you got to be thinking about, I'm not just growing corn. I've got to get alfalfa growing well, too. Good seed bed, important. Got to have good weed control, of course, and uh, Roundup Ready systems seem to have been working better than other herbicide management systems that we've looked at. And um, something we found that's interesting is these uh, plant protection products seem to be especially useful in Wisconsin, more so than other states. So um, there's been work done some years ago that indicated that stand survival of alfalfa is relatively short in Wisconsin compared to some other states like Iowa and, and so forth. So there's something about our soils and growing conditions that alfalfa is under a bit more stress. So we need the agrochemicals, certainly in Wisconsin, uh, maybe not so much in other states. Also uh, doing another grant project um, um, here in Wisconsin and out in Idaho. And we're trying to look at the uh, timing of corn planting, alfalfa interseeding, and corn harvest uh, on the uh, establishment of uh, the alfalfa and the yields of, um, of alfalfa and corn silage. And in this study, we also want to look at the long-term yields of a conventional alfalfa seeding system that farmers are using and comparing it to our interseeded system. So far, I've been just showing you data from that first year of alfalfa production. But what about over the long haul? Is interseeded alfalfa going to give you uh, good yields that are uh, comparable to a, a, a conventional spring seeded alfalfa, for example? Okay, that's what I have for you today. So if you've got some questions, I'd be glad to, to, to take those. I, I appreciate your attention and not nodding off. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, good, good question. Uh, we have looked at seeding rates uh, a bit, and um, you, you want to have pretty much a normal seeding rate of alfalfa, so we typically go with about 16 pounds per acre of alfalfa seed uh, for interseeding. If we go down too much farther than that, for example, if you cut the seeding rate in half, you really start affecting your plant population of alfalfa uh, in the fall. So you need a normal seeding rate. Good question. Thanks. Yes, sir. Okay, good question. So what about the cost of perhexidione, and does that growth retardant affect corn? So the way we do the uh, perhexidione applications is that we try to direct most of the spray down onto the alfalfa. The lower leaves of corn can get it without affecting the corn growth, but if you spray it right over the top of the corn, you reduce the amount of product that can get down to alfalfa, and you can also stunt the corn and in some cases uh, reduce the yield a bit. So you want to try and get that product down. And the cost per acre, I guess we're going to have to see once the label gets approved and put out. I mean, we're, we're anticipating, hoping the cost will be probably about $30 an acre. So, so we, tried, we figured that in with our economic analyses that I was showing you, the cost, our guesstimate of what the product would cost along with fungicide, insecticide. So... Good question. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, then. Well, hey, thanks a lot. Uh, enjoy Expo. Um, have a great day. <laughs>